I think because when we first met, we were tolerant of a lot of things, like you were very tolerant of my excessive drinking and excessive behaviour. Then when I had a breakdown and it locked up and then getting in hospital, then it was impossible not to talk about it. That's true, but you were in a sort of semi-catatonic state, so we didn't really talk about it then. And then the doctor who diagnosed you said it was a drink-related breakdown, so that gave you an excuse, I think, to think, oh, it was all to do with drinks, so I'll stop drinking and the problems will go away. But actually, the problems were just sort of buried and didn't really surface again for another 20 years. One of the reasons I got angry was I thought I'd done all the hard yards by not drinking, by getting through the breakdown, by recovering, by rebuilding myself. Then we had kids and all that, and it all, I all mm. felt it sort of ought to be fine now, and then it wasn't. So the depressions kept coming. And then the gaps started to get narrower and narrower and narrower. And the worst thing about it, I couldn't talk. When I was really depressed, I couldn't yeah, even that's talk. that's true. You were very <coughs> high-functioning at that stage. You were working for the Prime Minister, you were travelling all over the place. You didn't seem like somebody that was ill. So a lot of the time, I think I felt like I was the person who was a little bit crazy, because I kept saying, I think there's something wrong with Alistair, and people say, oh, no, 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 he's, you know, very successful. It was only when you stopped doing that and had a massive crash that it became obvious that things had to really be addressed. And I think that's when we started talking about it. And then, so that time, I think it was your idea, let's go out for a walk, let's go walk, let's go and talk about it, da-da-da-da-da. And we went out here and we went over there, and I was just... I felt I was going insane. I really did. Mm. And I remember, I was, I was never, ever, ever going to hit you, ever, but I was feeling violent and I started to punch myself in the face. Mm. I started literally bang, bang, bang in the eye and I could see you were looking absolutely terrified. Mm. I remember you saying, that I'm really worried, I think you're losing your mm. sanity. Mm. So we went, we talked about it and then went and I saw David again and I think he realised then how bad it was and bit by bit. Mm sorted out, but the thing I always do now, I always say to you, when I feel the depression coming on, even if it's only mild, and it used to be I would just mm. lock, lock, go into lockdown, now, I, first thing I say is, I think I'm getting depressed again. And you always say, and it sort of annoys me, but I understand <laughs> why you say it, you always say, what triggered it? You mm. always say that. And I always say, I don't know. And then you always now say, at least, I think you should go and see David. Yeah, but that's because I feel powerless to yeah. do anything, to help, really. Yeah, but you do help by saying that. You do help. Mm. I think a lot of the partners of people who are mentally ill go through this sense that there's something wrong with them and they're mm. to blame mm. because of the lack of communication and the lack of explanation, really. Mm. I actually think, as well as talking to you, as well as having David to talk to, I actually do think the public talking has helped me massively. Mm. And even wandering around here, when you bump into people, mm. a number of people who come up yeah. and say, God, I'm so glad you talk about this, because I'm this and I'm that. And or it's, I've got a child who's got yeah, it. All, and yeah, and it's everywhere. Mm. And, I, and I actually, that makes me, you know, purely, it's not selfish, I, it makes me feel better. Mm.